here. Um, please make yourself known to one of the leaders or the welcome team with the um, lanyards that you can clearly see. Um, Sorry? You're not on. You're not on. I'm not on. I'm on now, aren't I? Yes. I've got a green light. Doesn't mean anything particularly. Anyway, just a few quick notices. There's no nuts tonight. Um, Friday, it's fun family. Friday! Thank you. Starting at 6 o'clock till 7.30. All families are welcome. And if you haven't got a family, Come and help anyway. Um, it's a, a meal, a hot meal, and then we come through here at quarter seven for 45 minutes of fun, stories, games, and, and chaos, really. But with Chico. So it's all good, all good. Um, Saturday morning, it's a monthly prayer breakfast, men's breakfast. So if you're a man, and you are more than welcome to come to that. Um, if you need any more information, see Tony. Is it 9 o'clock or 9.30? Yeah, 9 for 9.30. 9 for 9.30. Thank you very much. Um, next Sunday evening at 6.30 is our monthly prayer meeting in church. Um, so I hope you'll be able to join us for, for that. Last week we announced that Morris Thornley had passed away uh, with the Lord now. His funeral is on Monday the 23rd of May and following um, a private family committal at the crematorium, there will be a Thanksgiving service here at 2.30, followed by tea and cake in the hall. Um, and Jason will be leading that, that service. Um, we're in the process of renewing the church address book, so if you haven't filled in the form yet, there's some at the back or in the hall um, over the next two or three weeks. If you'd like to be included in that, please complete one of the forms. Uh, our preacher this morning is Frank Brearley from New Tribes, and uh, we welcome him today, and we look forward to hearing as he opens up God's Word from 1 Peter chapter 4, a little later in the service. So I'm just going to read a few verses from Psalm 66. Shout joyful praises to God, all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Your enemies cringe before your mighty power. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious songs. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can meet with you this morning and that you are greater and stronger and higher than any other. You are a healer. You are awesome in power. Yet you still are our Father and our God. So we pray that you will bless our time together this morning. Amen. So let's stand and sing the song, Our God. We will be taking up um, this morning's collection during the second song this morning.
stronger. You are higher than any other. You are the one and only true God. You came to bear our sorrow, sins and shame when you carried them to the cross and laid them to rest there. But then you rose again from the dead. You defeated death and thereby opened the way to eternal life for all who follow in you. All praise to the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, our triune God. Hello? Oh, there we go. That was scary. Right, okay, so this morning we have a special treat. Um, in junior church, one of the things that, of course, we t uh, aim to do is to teach the children the Bible, okay? So we teach them stories from the Bible, um, sometimes we memorize scripture, but also what we feel like it's important to do is to try and give them the tools to help them learn to read the Bible for themselves. Um, and one of the things that we want to do is demystify the Bible a little bit. Um, 66 books, it's massive, there's loads of words that they don't understand, so picking that up at first can be quite daunting. 
So what we also try to do is teach them a bit about how the Bible works. What's the Old Testament? What's the New Testament? And one of the things that we've been doing is getting them to memorize the books of the Bible in order. It's something that I did when I was a young believer, and it's been really practically helpful for me as I've studied the Bible myself. They start to learn the names of the books, and then as we're teaching them the stories, they start to understand where they come in scripture. The older ones can start to find it for themselves in the Bibles that we give them. So they've been memorizing the books of the Bible. Um, and we started with the New Testament, slightly less books. Um, but they've done it now. They've memorized the books of the New Testament. And they would really like to show you all what they've done. Um, so if you are in junior church and you've been memorizing the books of the New Testament and you would like to come up and show people what you've learned, that would be great. Please come up and don't make me say it all by myself. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Wasn't that great? Really, really great, and uh, an encouragement to all of us to learn our books of the Bible. But um, I just want to read from 2 Timothy chapter 4, two verses. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these children, that they are such a blessing and inspiration to us. We thank you for the teachers of all the junior church that go out every week and the different groups during the week that also teach the scriptures to the children. And we pray that the the words that are taught will rest in these children's hearts and be fundamental to how they live their lives and will rest and be good teaching that will carry them through all the ways and all the days to eternity. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Liam and Ellen. My chains are gone, I've been set free because my God, my Saviour, has ransomed me. Shall we stand together?
Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great privilege to. No. I should be. Um, I am. I'm on this side. It's on number two. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Number two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just wait. Can you hear? Yeah. No, it should be working. I can use the hand mic if needs be. Then. Hand mic, then, please. Hand mic, yeah. Technology. <coughs> who, who would work in technology? If anyone, there is an opening for the sound crew. If anyone. Wants to. <laughs> so, so uh, as we gather in prayer, yeah, I have the great privilege to pray to our heavenly Father. Uh, after this, pr after the prayers, and the children who can go out into their groups. But I think it's uh, it's good to have them in as we pray as a family together, um, as we pray to our, our heavenly Father. So let us pray. Yours, O God, is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the victory and the majesty, for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as high above all. Both riches and honour come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Your love is everlasting. Your grace and mercy is new every morning. You and you alone are holy. And so we confess our sin to you. Father, forgive us for not relying on your grace alone, but look into the things of this world to give us happiness, contentment and meaning. We confess our dependency on our own righteousness. We often seek to justify ourselves before you by our own obedience. Even though the work of our hands cannot be accepted into your holy presence. We denounce others for the inability to do good while ignoring the pride that prevails in our lives. Father, forgive us. Jesus, thank you for being our great high priest. Thank you, thank you that as our representative, you never offered your father dead works. All your obedience came from a heart fixed on pleasing your heavenly father. Your hands and your hearts were pure and clean as you offered the perfect and unblemished life of obedience in your place. Holy Spirit, give us the confidence to draw near to your throne of grace. Not a confidence in ourselves and our own goodness, but a confidence found upon the Lord Jesus and his merit alone. Teach us to enthrone Christ in our hearts and to be humbled. Equip us to serve others out of the same mercy and grace that we ourselves had received. Give us the joy and gladness that comes from knowing that Jesus has offered the once and for all sacrifice in our place. And that he is returning again to be reunited with his people forever. We pray for unity as a fellowship. May you be glorified as we mirror the unity of di that is displayed in the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Three persons united in love. We pray for our town of Grimsby. Help us to be salt and light, empty us of the world and fill us with your grace. We think of Fun Family Friday this coming week. Help us to serve the people from the surrounding area and point them to you our only hope in life and death. As a church family, help us to minister your grace. 
Help us to be teachable. Help us to be ministered to by others. Teach us your truths. Confront us with our sin. Accept your fatherly care. Hold us accountable. Sanctify us by your truth. Keep us focused on you, Lord. Keep us gospel focused. Give us a love for gospel fellowship. Help us to make sense of our faith and to be active in it. Fathers, give us the peace to accept the things we cannot change. Courage to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one moment at a time. Enjoying one day at a time. Accepting hardship as a pathway of peace. Taking as you did this sinful world, not as it is. Not as we would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if we surrender to your will. So that we may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever and ever in the next. Father, be with the children as they go to their groups. Open blind eyes to see the glory of who you are and what you have done for us. We ask all these things in your holy and glorious name. Amen. The passage this morning talks about us being part of God's family, members of his family, because of what Christ sacrificed for us on the cross. And verse 2 of this next song actually says those words. So can we stand together and sing beneath the cross of Jesus?
we on? Uh, the reading this morning is from 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, I am yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning. Lovely to be uh, uh, with you and to be able to uh, share <clears throat> uh, God's word. Um, let's pray. Father, we ask you to speak, Lord, in the stillness while we wait upon you. Hush our hearts to listen in expectancy. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the uh, court church in Innsbruck, Austria, is a, a life-size bronze statue of Godfrey of Boulogne. He was a, a French uh, noble who was involved in the Crusades that took place in the uh, 11th to the 14th uh, century, where... <coughs> Forces represented Christianity were seeking to oust the forces of Islam to possess Jerusalem and the uh, Holy Land as it was regarded. Now, when uh, the first capture, recapture of Jerusalem took place, Godfrey was leading that and he was made the leader of Jerusalem until his death, actually quite quickly afterwards in uh, AD 1100. Now, the... The statue that in this church in Austria has uh, Godfrey dressed in full armor. He's got his sword by his side. He has a, a shield uh, in, in, in front of his leg there. And he has the helmet on to pr protect him. But what is interesting is that the helmet has on it a crown of thorns. And it seems that the artist added the crown of thorns, a symbol of Christ's sufferings, reminding us of the sacred cause for which the armour was worn as Godfrey went forth to the battle. And here in the opening verse of 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 1, Peter draws the attention of his readers to the fact that as the Lord Jesus Christ suffered the hostilities of a world under satanic control. We too are engaged in that same war and must anticipate suffering too. But just as Jesus in the days of his flesh fought the good fight and triumphed through suffering, 
so we too can be overcomers in the holy war, armed with the right attitude to suffering. So here in verse 1 we read, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves. It's a word, uh, a military word. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So since Jesus suffered during the days of his flesh, that is to say throughout his life from his incarnation, he was under attack of satanic forces to, uh, to kill him. And then throughout his life until finally he died on the cross, we too must anticipate that we too will face antagonism and hostility. And he says there that we need to reflect, we need to train our thinking to remind ourselves of the reality of what Jesus went through. It was a life of suffering. He suffered opposition from the religious leaders, the antagonism of, uh, of those who professed uh, to be followers of Yahweh. He was rejected. His message was rejected. His mission was rejected. He was hated. And in spite of all the good that he did, evil was returned to him until ultimately he was put to death as a common criminal. And Peter wants to forewarn his readers that they might be forearmed to anticipate the inevitable hostilities from a life that comes out of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, our mindset is critical to overcoming the world's pressures, which is constantly squeezing, seeking to conform us to its dictates. It wants us to be swallowed up in its ideologies until we become so absorbed by society's cultures and values and goals that we lose our essential identity as Christians. If you've ever read that little pamphlet, booklet by C.T. Studd called The Chocolate Soldier, um, he speaks of Christians being like sweeties, bonbons, wrapped in their fine little dressings, who melt, you know, of any heat of, of, of battle. You see, going with the flow is always the pathway of least resistance. But our lives will be of no temporal value to God. There'll be a loss of eternal reward, and we will not experience the fellowship of his sufferings that comes from of a life of obedience to him. Jim Packer, in his book, Knowing God, he writes of a, a Christian academic who basically forfeited his prospects of academic advancement because he clashed with the denominational leaders over the gospel of grace. And as he spoke to Packer, he said, but it doesn't matter that they've squashed my prospects. He said, because I have known God and they haven't. And there's something about that, you know, that as we identify with Christ, as we go through uh, hostilities, antagonism towards us, one experiences that special presence and comfort that comes from the Lord Jesus. He says here, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. You see, outlook determines outcome. And for be believers to be overcomers in the spiritual war we are engaged in, we too must be armed with the right attitude. I love that hymn that Townens uh, wrote, O Church of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ, our captain. Verse 2 says, when faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. But it is being armed with the same way of thinking 
that first of all leads us to a change of allegiance. He says here, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. To truly identify with Jesus requires the believer to make a choice. And there are only two possible paths to follow in this life. He sets them out here. It's either sin or suffering. And the believer can choose to live like the unsaved world around him. He can live for the sin, same sinful pleasures and objectives and avoid suffering. Or he can take the path of loyalty and allegiance to Jesus, which will inevitably lead to experiencing the reproach of Christ. He says here in verse 4, you'll be maligned. He says here in verse 14, you will be insulted. So when the believer nails his colors to the mast in allegiance to Jesus and deliberately chooses to suffer as an obedient follower of Jesus rather than continue in a life of sin, he ceased from sin. This doesn't mean he never he never commits acts of sin, but that the power of sin in his life has been broken. It is this allegiance to Jesus that compels us, as he says here in verse 2, to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So the question is asked, how will we spend the rest of our lives after we have trusted in Jesus as Savior? He says here, will it be for human passions as it was before? Or is it going to be for the will of God? Are we going to live for our own selfish desires? Or are we going to choose God's will for our lives? When we choose to follow Jesus and God's will for our lives, we discover his will for us is so superior to anything we could conceive. I always find it interesting, you know, talking to people about the will of God and people are afraid that if they say, yes, Lord, whatever the cost, I'm going to follow you. They I imagine that they're going to be sent to the jungles of New Guinea or maybe uh, to Africa or maybe to South America. Well, some of us have lived in those places and we found the will of God amazing to see God use our lives in remarkable ways in bringing people to faith and trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing to be scared of in the will of God. You see, the, the will of God comes from the heart of God. It's, it's an expression of his love and his perfect purposes for his life. We can never improve on his will uh, for us. A will that makes our lives lasting and, and satisfying, godly and, and righteous, that is accompanied by divine blessing and his smile. And then, of all things, eternal rewards later. When we choose to break with our past lives and fully embrace the will of God, rather than continuing to indulge our human passions, we are not sacrificing anything, but securing God's best for our lives. He goes on and speaks of the former life in verse 3. The time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. And here Peter refers to their lives before they came to trust in Christ. It was the way the uh, Gentiles lived and what they uh, sought. It was a hedonistic lifestyle to engage in uh, selfish pleasures of a sexual nature uh, substance abuse through alcohol and, and drugs idolatry false worship that involved religious prostitution these words here and practices describe the lifestyle they engaged in that is past it was disgusting then. 
It was degrading then. It was <laughs> depraved then, and still is. Now, they were new creatures in Christ, and the old way of life was to be abandoned to live the rest of their lives in the will of God. We may not have been involved in some of the gross sins and practices that are spoken to of here, but we've all followed our own desires. We've all done our own thing without reference to God. We've enjoyed the pleasures of, uh, of this world. And all those things necessitated the Lord Jesus Christ's death on the cross. He paid for those sins there. How foolish, how diabolical to continue or to return to such self-indulgence. For those of you who were converted early in life and spared much of this self-inflicted grief, be thankful. And when you share your testimony, don't be embarrassed to say, I came to faith early in life. Sometimes people are kind of reticent about saying those things. They hear testimonies of people who've gone through all kinds of horrendous situations and circumstances. I remember a young lady in our own church who went through some things that, uh, well, you wouldn't want to describe the things that she was involved in prior to salvation. She didn't want any more to speak, to think of, of, of those things. So don't apologize. Thank God if you came to faith and trusted Jesus at an early stage in life. But perhaps uh, some have lived in self-indulgence and have lived to regret some of the things that they were involved in. But thank God for the years that remain, the years that are still there to know this wonderful God and to be able to live in obedience to him. You see, only God is capable of making up for the past and regain for us an opportunity in the future, which we wasted while we were unsaved. There's a lovely verse in the prophet Joel that says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. Only God can do that. So he says here, being armed with the same way of thinking leads to a change of allegiance, with the resulting change of activities. He says here in verse 4, with respect to this, the things that he's just said, he said, they, folks outside, he said, are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. I remember as a 21-year-old coming to faith in Christ and, uh, and, and sharing that with my friends. And the word that was going around is, really has got religion. Can you believe that? And uh, they could remember you know, the things that we were uh, uh, engaged in. And uh, of course, I became the butt uh, of their jokes and uh, was no longer uh, welcome in, in those circles. I was going to be a, a party pooper. But probably most of us, after trusting Jesus as Savior, found ourselves misunderstood, uh, laughed at, taunted, uh, ridiculed. I found it amazing that even our families, I remember, you know, parents absolutely worried sick wondering what was going to happen when we went out on Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. Or when we went off to the lakes for a week, supposedly, climbing. They were worried sick. But when we got converted, it wasn't that they were full of joy that, you know, there's a life of sanity now. Don't come preaching to us. Warren Wearsby in his commentary said, unsaved people do not understand the radical change that their friends experience when they trust Christ and become children of God. They don't think it's strange when people wreck their bodies, destroy their homes and ruin their lives by running from one sin to another. But let a drunkard become sober or an immoral person pure and the family thinks he's lost his mind. 
He says here, the reaction of the world described by Peter, it says, they will malign you. King James Version says they will speak evil of you. The NIV says they heap abuse on you. The actual Greek word is very much like our English word, blaspheme. Speaking, you know, with contempt, slandering, defaming, mocking. And this was the kind of opposition and persecution that these believers out there in Asia Minor spread out in uh, today's uh, uh, Turkey. This was the type of hostility they were experiencing. They were ostracized from uh, society. They were outcasts. They were not included. They were in the in crowd. They were in the out crowd. They suffered the unfriendly acts of neighbors who were totally against them. We read earlier of wives who were ill-treated by their pagan husbands. We read of the employers who took it out on their Christian slaves. They were discriminated against. They were marginalized. This is the type of hostility that is being spoken of here. And this type of pressure and suffering in our society is becoming more and more uh, prevalent and commonplace. I remember reading of a, a lady who uh, worked at Heathrow Airport and uh, wanted just to you know, note the fact that she was a Christian uh, uh, by wearing a crucifix. And then, then she faced a, a, a tribunal. Or a, a nurse who was asked to pray you know, with, with the patient, wanted the person to pray, and, and then she you know, was sacked and, and, and faced industrial tribunal. I'm so thankful for organizations like the Christian Institute or CARE or Christian Legal Center, Christian Concern, who you know, take on the legal authorities over these issues. We're, we're all you know, continuing to witness the growth in opposition to, uh, to Christian values and standards so that you know, society will tolerate any kind of sexuality. But to speak of sexual abstinence before marriage and then only between a man married to his wife, that is viewed as intolerance, bigotry, narrow-mindedness, or it's even getting worse. If any of you received your Christian Institute leaflet this week, I was reading that. There are pressure groups who are lobbying the lawmakers in our country to criminalize advocating for being true to God's word and its teaching on gender and sexuality. In February 2022, the state of Victoria in Australia passed laws against conversion therapy which expressly criminalizes prayer if it is not deemed supportive of a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Imagine that. The penalty apparently can be up to 10 years in prison or a fine of 100,000 pounds. There are UK activists who were positively seeking to make this the standard by which our government introduces its new laws. Canada has already passed into law a bill banning conversion therapy. Its definition of conversion therapy includes any practice designed to reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior. That would mean you could not say anything against any other non-sexual activity in a relationship between a man and a woman who were married. Incredible. He says he had been armed with the same way of thinking as Jesus during his earthly life, facing the hostilities of the world opposed to godliness and righteousness, that it brings us into the same conflict that he faced. 
And we're faced with a choice. We can capitulate, we can conform to the world's culture of comfort, complicity with its values and objects, and compromise our commitment to God's word and to the Lord Jesus. Or we can, as the hymn writer expressed it, stand up, stand up for Jesus and be soldiers of the cross and enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. This change of allegiance leads us to a change of activities, but also to a, a change of awareness. So here in verse 5 he said, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. A day of reckoning is coming and nobody will escape it. When we face opposition and hostility as believers, it's our natural response to get very defensive or, 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 or to retaliate. But we need to be patient and merciful. We need to, again, remember that people have been spiritually blinded by the enemy of our souls. Yes, judgment awaits all those who refuse to accept Jesus as Savior. But we want to do everything, don't we, in our power to, to warn people of the judgment to come. But to say there is a way whereby you can experience forgiveness and, and never have to face that judgment. Such an awareness of eternal realities leads us to a change in actions. He says here in verse 6, For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. It is because of our awareness of this truth that all will face judgment and give an account to God that we make every effort to share the gospel and urge men and women to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, sin was judged at the cross. Christ, the sinless Son of God, took the judgment that our sin deserved. Our sin was laid on him. The wrath of God that was our due was actually poured out on him. And he suffered the righteous judgment of God upon our uh, sin. Sin was judged and paid for by Jesus at the cross. Now the gospel message here, he says, has been preached to and believed even to those who are dead. To those who heard the gospel while they were alive and came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says here that during their lives, they were judged in the flesh the way people are. They underwent and experienced the hostilities and judgments at the hands of their peers and their own generation of unbelievers. The world mocked them. The world treated them as being out of their minds, fanatical. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13 said, he says, we have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. One translation puts it this way. He said, we are like dirt underfoot, like garbage. But they who died, many of them persecuted, had been made spiritually alive because they trusted in what Christ had done. They believed the gospel. He says here that they might live in the spirit the way God does. That they might become partakers of the divine nature now. And then at death, enter into the presence of God and experience the joys, the eternal joys of heaven with him forever. No doubt, some of those who died, who had believed, died as Christian martyrs. The hostilities were so intense against them that many of them were put to death. 
because they were true uh, to Jesus. Though we're not experienced that degree of hostility in our country at this time. We do need to remember those who live in this world who are risking their lives day by day for their fidelity to Jesus. There are those in places like North Korea and China and in India and Pakistan, in, in Africa, in uh, Sudan and uh, Nigeria and Niger, Myanmar, Syria, who have been severely persecuted and being killed for their faithfulness to the Lord Jesus. As I say, we're not facing that degree of hostility in this country. But we ought not to be surprised when we are mocked and ridiculed for being Christians. When we are criticized and accused of bigotry, intolerance due to our beliefs and practices, when we are discriminated against, passed over for certain jobs and responsibilities because we refuse to engage in dishonest practices or even, you know, to comply and conform to the standards that are expected. I remember a few years ago listening to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, no, it's Professor Stuart Burgess. Some, some of you perhaps heard him. This brilliant uh, professor of engineering design in the Department of Mechanical Engineering there at Bristol University. He designed the transmission of the bikes that have won us all these medals at the Olympics in the cycle track racing. He designed the, the arm that after the satellite is launched, it mechanically extends this huge array of solar uh, panels in this hostile environment. He's the guy who's designed that for the four last satellites that have been sent up there. He's clearly brilliant, but he's an embarrassment to his university because he believes in six-day creation. He believes in a young earth. And they're thinking, how in the world can this guy, you know, stick on his uh, titles there? He's a professor in the University of Bristol. He's an embarrassment to us. And he's suffered all kinds of pressure to try and compromise. Peter says here, when we face this kind of hostility, verse 13, he says, Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So being armed with the same way of thinking gives us the right attitude as we engage in the same spiritual conflict that Jesus experienced during his life on this earth as he suffered. It leads to a change of allegiance. We've chosen to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. It leads to a change of activities. It says here, we do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. We leave the old sinful ways to live uprightly and to please God. I tell you, our young people go through incredible pressure in colleges, universities, and schools to engage in the same type of debauchery that is spoken of here. It takes tremendous courage to stand against the tide of licentiousness, immorality, and just do whatever you feel. A change of activities. This armed with the uh, same way of thinking leads us to a change of awareness. They will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Knowing that all men and women will face judgment due to sin. We want them to face the judgment of their sin here and now, not later. We want them to come to a realization of their sin and the judgment it deserves. But then to turn to the cross and to embrace Jesus who took that judgment for them. Who paid for that sin? 
a new awareness. And then he says it brings us to a change of action. He says, for this, for this is why the, the gospel was preached. The only remedy provided for lost mankind separated from God by sin has been provided by God through the gift of his son, our Savior. Is he the one that you are trusting in this morning? Is he the one that you've embraced and loved and have said, Lord, whatever time I've left in my life, I want to live it wholly for you. Our life's goal as God's ambassadors is uh, seen for us in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. It said, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled. God trust in the one and only Savior Jesus some time ago I was uh, using a, a daily devotional by uh, Tozer and one of these particular ones so struck me and impacted me that I photocopied it and I keep it in my Bible now and I, I look at it regularly the title of it is, Don't Let Me Live Wrong. He says, For years I have made a practice of writing many of my earnest prayers to God in a little book, a book now well worn. I still turn often to the petitions I recorded in that book. I remind God often of what my prayers have been. One prayer in the book, and God knows it well by this time, for I pray it often, it goes like this. Oh God, let me die rather than to go on day by day living wrong. I want to be right so that I can die right. Lord, I don't want my life to be extended if it would mean that I should cease to live right and fail in my mission to glorify you all of my days. He says, as you will recall from 2 Kings 20, the Lord gave Hezekiah a 15-year extension of life. Restored to health and vigor, Hezekiah disgraced himself and dishonored God before he died and was buried. He said, I would not want an extra 15 years in which to backslide and dishonor my Lord. I would rather go home right now than to live on if living on was to be a waste of God's time and my own. Please, Father, help me to finish well. Well, I could spend the next 30 minutes dealing with the rest of the passage, <laughs> but time will not allow. But I don't feel bad about that. The last verses actually highly repeat what Peter's already said. He gives some practical results, things that they should do as a result of this new response, of this responding in fidelity and faithfulness to Jesus. He says the end of all things is at hand. And how ought we to live? He tells them to be self-controlled and sober-minded, that to be of sound mind, to exercise self-constraint, not giving in to the pressure of conformity to this world that one's prayer life remains unhindered and powerful. He tells us there we're to love one another, we're to show hospitality to one another, we're to share and use our gifts that God gives to each one of us to edify and build one another up. And all that, he says, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ and to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we just ask that um, God will help us to preach his gospel till our dying breath. Let your kingdom come. Please stand together as we sing our final song.
Father, we thank you again for the reminder from your word. Lord, that our Lord Jesus Christ bore the hostilities of this world in order that he might be the one who would be the sacrifice on that cross at Calvary to bear our sins and pay the full price that it deserved. We thank you, Lord, that this message that you've given to us is to be proclaimed. We thank you, Father, that you've freed us from the penalty of sin. You've freed us from the power of sin. And we pray, Lord, that we might live in the power of your spirit as we seek to make Jesus known, to urge people against the judgment to come and to trust in Christ now. Lord, help each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.